Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on where does all the waste go once it leaves Cambridge. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen and hit presentation mode. So um, again, I'm Michael Orr, I'm the Recycling Director for the City of Cambridge in the Department of Public Works. I've been working there since 2015. And I love working within the city and I love kind of meeting people and, and having discussions around what we do with waste and, and how we can improve things. So let's jump right into it. So what is the solid waste and recycling division, which is, you know, where we, where I'm based out of, we're a division within the department of public works in Cambridge. We provide most of the collection of most residential waste. We do all the city buildings, we do public area, trash and recycling, and then we do some waste collection at small businesses. We send out nearly 20 collection trucks out uh, every day, and that it's a mix of city vehicles and contractors. Um, the recycle division within Public Works also manages the zero waste master plan, which we completed in 2018 and is kind of is something that's a piece of why we're having this webinar tonight to kind of talk about um, improving that plan, renewing it, trying to think a little bit more critically about how we can continue moving things along. But let's go into a little bit about what we've accomplished since 2018 as a community. So we've expanded the compost program to a citywide program back in 2018. It was only a pilot program before then, and we really wanted to branch out and get the whole city to participate. And it was up to 12 unit buildings at that point. We also started this small business recycle pilot in 2018. Moving forward, 2019, we started mattress recycling, and we did a campaign called Recycle Right to reduce the amount of contamination in recycling and to improve it. In 2020, we expanded the compost to all buildings on the city trash program. And uh, we expanded the business recycle program, and we extended yard waste collection by two weeks through the end of December. Um, 2020 also happened to be when COVID was, and so we also had a, a uh, increase in trash that year due to both, you know, more people at home and the compost program being suspended for a temporary point of time. But in 2021, we picked right back up to keep moving forward on zero waste. We started a business compost pilot and we began textiles recovery with those textile bins you might have seen and curbside textiles pickup. 2022, we launched the standard trash cart um, and this expanded the small business compost pilot. And so we did all these programs as kind of part of our zero waste efforts. Um, and so here's a little bit of info on like what we manage in terms of waste um, disposal in the city. So trash recycle, food waste or compost and the yard waste program we do every week. As you can see in the photo, those are kind of a typical set out or other set outs that often have a lot of those carts for the large multifamilies. We do mattresses, textiles, TVs, and e-waste collection, metal, appliance, and ACs. We manage universal waste at a recycle center, so batteries and fluorescent bulbs. We run the hazardous waste events four times a year. And we also have some other recycle center items that we collect that we send out for recycling, like plastic film and books. I won't be able to get into everything tonight, but I did want to kind of follow the top four bullets and like get the, the big ones that uh, people have the most questions on and, and um, interest in. So um, as part of our zero waste efforts, you know, what we've been doing is like trying to keep track of where we started and where we're going in terms of trash reduction. So this chart here shows on the left axis, the trash generation, and that's normalized based on pounds per household per week. So even though we've increased the number of households in the city and um, we wanted to kind of normalize to see if like the average household is doing better or worse than the year before. And as you can see, you know, we're on this great downward trend. Um, you see a little blip in 2020, but um, in 2023, we just got the final numbers in and we have had our best year yet with only 14.8 pounds of trash per household per week. And we set goals um, way back in 2009 to reduce trash 30% by 2020 and then 80% by 2050. And you can see that down here. So we want to get to 4.6 pounds per household per week by 2050. So um, we have an intermediate goal in 2030 to try to get to 12. We're at 14.8 right now. I think we are on the track, but uh, 
still a lot of work to get done on that. So we do keep track of this. And this is a big part of like how we're measuring how well we're doing as a community. So let's jump right into it. So where does your stuff go? So trash. Um, trash is hauled every day directly to a transfer station in Boston. The transfer station then puts um, the trash on trucks to either go to an incinerator or a landfill. If it's going to an incinerator, it's often um, on the north, uh, north um, part of Massachusetts in Haverhill. There's an incinerator there called Covanta. Um, if it's landfill, it's often put directly onto a rail car and sent by train um, out of state. In the last couple of years, we've heard um, the contractor that manages the trash, sometimes it goes to Michigan, sometimes it goes to Virginia. So trash is sent a very far ways away from here. Um, and that's a big reason why it's great to recycle and compost. And that's why it's actually cheaper for us to do both of those, because you can imagine it's very expensive to send trash that far. Recycling. Um, Probably one of the biggest questions we get, what do we do with it? So the recyclables are hauled by the truck you see here in the photo. They're hauled to Casella in Charlestown. It's right underneath I-93. Um, they sort all the stuff that you put into the recycling into 10 commodities. So there's a couple commodities within the paper category, a couple commodities in the plastics category. Those commodities are sold to manufacturers. And then once they're sold, that reduces the cost that the city pays for recycling. So um, it's a global commodity trade. And so when prices are high for recyclables, we actually see our costs come down. So for instance, during COVID, there was all these supply chain concerns. The price of recycling went way down because people wanted stuff to make cardboard boxes. People needed the, the raw material and there wasn't enough out there because of the supply chain issues. So recyclables were very valuable. Today, they're not as valuable because of some concerns around um, inflation and and other global kind of um, economic issues, but still much cheaper than trash. And that's that's what's really important. And it's and it's uh, still very important to keep recycling. Um, we know that uh, Casella recycles this stuff because they have to report to Mass DEP the end sites for recycling. So I'm gonna get right into the weeds on this. This is where your recyclables go. And this is pretty applicable to most people in the Boston area, probably almost everyone in the Boston area. So paper and cardboard go to either New York or Maine, or sometimes um, some cardboard goes to India and Vietnam. And so the buyers in those places will buy these raw material, turn it into cardboard or paperboard. And paperboard you can kind of think of as like a cereal box. Um, printer paper they'll make out of it, tissues, paper towels, toilet paper, virtually any kind of paper item you could think of um, is, is made out of your old paper and cardboard. For plastics, um, they're sent to either New York, Pennsylvania, or Alabama, depending on the type of plastic. And the plastics can be turned into new recycle carts like you have at your home. Um, so the carts that we buy and then give to the community members, they all have a minimum of 30% recycled content. So some of the plastic you recycled in your bin today could be literally inside of your cart tomorrow meaning it's made up, your card is made of the plastic you recycled. So I think that's always kind of fun to think about. Um, other things that can be made into toys, furniture, clothing, bags, paint cans, um, food containers. Aluminum goes right back into making your own beer or soda cans. So it's just aluminum can to aluminum can. Tin cans, similar. So they'll make steel cans out of them or bicycles. And glass is the most unique of the item. So glass is recycled into what's called aggregate. Aggregate is a product used in a lot of road and building construction. Um, it's used a little bit as like a base. Sometimes it's used as like helping with drainage with like, you know, moisture drainage. Um, it's not going back into a glass bottle, which would be ideal, um, but it's still considered beneficial use because we're displacing the demand for virgin materials. Meaning someone doesn't have to go and like, mine for aggregate as much because this glass that um, our, our contractor Casella has will turn it into aggregate. So um, still beneficial use, not quite as ideal. And, and part of that is just markets are, are complicated for glass recycling in, in the Northeast because we don't have a recycler in the Northeast for glass. Um, 
Okay, so moving a little bit more forward. So how is the recycling sorted? It's really interesting and um, I'll show you a couple of photos and videos. So we have, there's optical scanners, there's screens, there's eddy currents, robotics, and more. It's very highly technical, requires a lot of engineering. So Casella just spent $20 million to retrofit their processing facility. It's the fifth largest recycling facility in the U.S. So it was a huge undertaking, but also like a, you know, well worth the investment to, to improve the recycling process there. So here's a group of um, city staff, recycling advisory committee members, um, a couple other community members taking a tour at Casella. So here's what it looks like. Um, the photo on the right is where the recycling is dumped. This big vehicle here is called a front loader. They're going to pick up the recycling and put it right into the drum feeder, which is here, which will then start the process of getting the recyclable sorted. Um, so this is like another kind of photo similar to that. This is an engineering mock-up of what the process looks like. And I'm not going to go into detail on this because it's just a lot. And I think that's kind of the point of this is that it's complicated and, um, you know, we could you could almost write a dissertation on, on how to best manage recyclables at a facility like this. But basically what we were just looking at were these things, the front loaders here feeding the drum right here. And so what happens is through screens and um, optical scanners and robotics and all this stuff, it just makes its way through here on these conveyor belts, going through the different systems to separate out the materials based on weight and size and what kind of material it is. And it goes through all this, all these systems, and then I'll show you the end product in just a little bit. So here's a little bit of the behind the scenes. So here's you know one conveyor belt probably um, taking paper up the conveyor belt. Um, and then you can see here a worker just doing quality control to make sure that's just paper making its way through and it looks pretty clean. Um, on the right is a bunker of aluminum. So this is what the finished product looks like at the end. So all the aluminum cans all squished together. Um, and then I have this fun little video. It's very quick, but this is a robotic doing its thing with the sorting. So yeah, like I said, it's very quick video, but basically this robotic has a suction cup right here and it's, it's told to only pick up either aluminum or maybe a plastic item and it'll put it in a different bunker. And so this robotic arm is basically working as like extra quality control to make sure that like all the paper that's going towards the paper section doesn't include aluminum or plastic for instance and so by picking those out it makes it a cleaner product for the paper bale but also we get to capture some more aluminum and plastic so i'll show the video real quick one more time yeah it's lightning fast so Anyway, I thought that'd be really interesting to kind of share. We didn't, we weren't able to get a lot of video, but um, just to show you a little bit of that. So um, here's the end product. You'll see these are large bales. These are all about a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds each. So this is like all paper. This one looks like all cardboard, cardboard, cardboard. You know, paper. Um, the aluminum is probably sort of separate somewhere else, but paper is the largest part of our recycling. So that's why. You see a lot of it in this photo. So these are the finished products and then they're going to go and get sold. So that's the recycling process in a nutshell. Um, I kind of said that we wouldn't talk a lot about like how exactly to sort material, but I think it's good to always talk about the common recycling questions that I get. So pizza boxes, yes, always we want them. Paper cartons though, that's like your paper milk carton or your paper ice cream tub, those are unfortunately not accepted anymore. So that has been sort of recent change. Um, I wish I had better news to share, but I do not, unfortunately. But uh, um, moving on, so another question I get, caps. So leave the caps on all containers, doesn't matter what they're made out of, either the top or the bottom, just put the caps on for all containers. They designed these recycling facilities to like know that people are doing that. So then they're able to like separate them out at the right time. So it's good to keep them on. Some of the most common mistakes um, that we see are, are here on the right. And this is part of our Recycle Right campaign we did a couple of years ago. So we never want 
recyclables bagged. So never put them in a plastic bag. We don't want plastic bags in general. We don't want clothing, hazardous items, tanglers, food or liquids. And um, to determine whether a plastic item is accepted, one rule to remember is rigid and container. And that'll help you determine for the most part, whether a plastic item is recyclable. So rigid and container means it's recyclable. Okay, so that's enough on recycling. Let's move on to compost or food waste. So we haul the food waste to waste management core facility also in Charlestown. This one's underneath the Tobin Bridge though. The food is slurried into an oatmeal consistency and then it's shipped to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District to create clean energy. So this is a new type of food waste management that people might not have heard of as much. Um, it's called anaerobic digestion and what's generated is methane and that methane is used to make electricity and heat for the facility. Um, and then biosolids are the leftover solids at the end of the product. Those are dried and sold. Um, it's kind of like a fertilizer. So here's some photos. First stop, here's our orange compost collection truck dumping the food waste on the floor here. That is then picked up with a front loader similar to what we saw in recycling and put into a processing tank. The processing tank will pull out any contaminants and then the oatmeal turns it into an oatmeal consistency, puts it in this big tank we have here. And there's actually three of them in this building. Um, you can see in the photo on the right, this is the uh, um, operations guy there. He is holding uh, like a, a, a blender full of the oatmeal consistency. That's kind of what it looks like, the blended food waste. Um, so that's the first stop. The second stop is this big facility called the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, no located in North Andover, Mass. Um, you can see as kind of for some scale, here's a little car right here. So it's a pretty big facility with lots of big items. And so this is where the food waste will end up. So it, when it's trucked there, it's combined with the stuff we flush down the toilet, the sink and the shower drain. All the materials mixed anaerobically without oxygen is what that means in a large round anaerobic digestion tank, which must be kept at 98.6 degrees. Coincidentally, just like our stomachs. Um, but unlike our stomachs, stomachs, you know, create energy in the form of mechanical energy. What an anaerobic digestion tank does is it creates energy in the form of methane. So that methane is captured. It's used to run a combined heat and power turbine, which means it's creating its own heat and its own power all at the same time. So it's a very highly efficient process. Um, so all the electricity that the facility needs is generated by the food waste. And so that means they don't have to buy any energy from the grid. And as a matter of fact, they give energy back to the grid most of the time. And then they also use the leftover methane or the leftover heat to dry the remaining solids to create biosolids. So you want to reduce the water content to reduce emissions for trucking. So because this process was designed considering all the energy needs of the facility, the waste heat after making electricity is used to maintain temperature in the digester tank and to heat buildings. So super efficient, really interesting. So we took a tour with some city councilors, some city staff, and some um, residents. Here's the tanker truck that takes all of our food waste from Charlestown, takes it to North Andover, pumps it in right here. And then after it's in the receiving tank, it's then piped into this big digester. So this is massive, as you can tell. You can't even see the whole, the whole thing of it. Um, and so that'll digest the food waste and create the methane. And then the methane goes to this power generation building where there's a turbine inside that will create its own electricity. So what's um, a, a lot of questions I get around like, you know, is this the right thing environmentally? Like, how do we know? And what's great is the US EPA decided to do um, and consult and hire a consultant firm called um, Eastern Research Group located in Lexington, Mass, to conduct a life cycle analysis. And it's a 194 page report. So if you want to find it, you can just search GLSD EPA life cycle. And um, basically, the chart on the right shows, and this is just one environmental attribute, global warming potential. But the global warming potential is you want, if something is advantageous, you want it to be near zero or below zero net greenhouse, um, sorry, global warming potential. So they compared landfill incineration, which is called waste to energy, composting, 
in two different ways, and then co-digestion, so anaerobic digestion. So the worst thing on here is obviously the landfill. We never want food waste to go to landfill. It has the most amount of global warming potential. Um, it does say, which I don't think is the fairest thing, it does say that composting is slightly positive um, global warming potential, but I think that that may not include like the longevity of like compost and the importance of that. But basically the anaerobic digestion has the lowest global warming potential of all the options. And so this is a um, pretty interesting report. And, and, you know, we're very proud that our food waste is going to make this clean energy that is definitely moving Massachusetts in the right direction um, in terms of fighting climate change. So uh, moving forward into yard waste. So the yard waste is hauled to Landscape Express in either Woburn or West Roxbury or to the Save That Stuff facility in Brockton. So we took a tour with um, some residents there in Brockton. Here's a pile of the finished compost from the yard waste process. Um, so the finished compost is processed and sold to soil users like landscapers. And I actually do have a little bit more to share. I have a couple of videos and I'm gonna try to do this quickly so we can keep everyone's attention. Um, but I have some videos and these are available anytime for people if they want to see it. This is the facility from an aerial view. And here's our yard waste truck dumping its leaves right there at the site. So looks very similar to the recycled truck as well. And here is the facility with quite a lot of yard waste. Looks like 25 feet tall and maybe the length of a football field or something. So pretty big operation there. Um, and then here's like a video quickly of the heat being generated from the compost process of the yard waste. And here's the screener. So this item removes large debris like sticks and branches. Um, And here's the finished product coming off the other end. So nice finished compost, beautiful dark soil. So that's our yard waste process. Let me get back into the presentation. And um, what's really cool is um, they give finished compost back to the city. Save That Stuff is our hauler for recycling and yard waste, but they also process it. And so every year they give us um, 30 tons of finished compost for finished compost giveaways that we do each spring. So if you're not aware, we give away some of the soil that we just saw being made. Um, if you're on our email newsletter, you will get an update on that for this spring. Um, but also the forestry division gets some of the finished compost and they use it for the tree nursery that they have. So every time they're wanting to plant a tree in the city, they're using the soil that came from the yard waste that you, the resident, put out. So Great, you know, kind of beautiful, like circular economy kind of process here. Um, all right, next up, mattresses. So those are hauled to Lawrence by UTEC. It's an awesome nonprofit. They do the most amazing work. They help people that are at risk um, for just going down the wrong path in life. And they are just a phenomenal organization. So look them up if you have a, have a moment. They, they do a lot of great stuff. Like they um, sell wooden cutting boards from scrap wood for instance, they sell those at Whole Foods. Um, really cool stuff. So they're not just about helping people, but they're helping the environment. So they belay all the mattresses that residents sign up to have collected. They'll extract the cotton, the metal, the wood, and any other fibers. And here's a little bit about the process of that. So you've got the mattresses here, and then they fillet them, they get all the metal out, and then they'll get all the kind of fabrics out here and here. You can see some of the cotton over here. So and they bail it up and send it out to the markets to whoever is going to buy them and turn them into something else. So again, awesome organization, UTech. Okay, next up are textiles. So we have a company called Helpsy that does the hauling of these. Helpsy is a B corporation. So that means they're for-profit, but they are... Um, you know, B Corps are corporations that are leaders in the global movement for more inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economy. So they're trying to really be about not just being a for-profit, but like also helping um, in all these kind of 
more progressive kind of ways of thinking about business. So what happens with the textiles, they sort them into three grades. The best grade is sold to secondhand and thrift shops. So the best textile items. The second best grade is um, sold to entities that will repair the item and then resell them. And the things of the lowest quality will get sold to recyclers that will like shred up the textile, turn it into a rag or turn it into shoddy, which is like a, um, used underneath a lot of carpets um, or insulation. So a lot of cars have insulation that are made from um, shredded up textiles. Um, and then TVs and e-waste. So after the curbside collection, um, their, uh, curbside collection and the drop-off at the recycle center, the e-waste is hauled by Good Point Recycling. They're based in Middlebury, Vermont, um, but they have a site here in Brockton, Mass. Um, they are the most progressive e-waste company that we've heard of. Um, they capture as many of the components as they can and reuse and repair them before recycling. So... The owner, Robin Ingenthron, um, he's often listed on this list of like, you know, the best recyclers in the world because he's got like a worldwide network of people he work with to make sure that things are getting recycled and upcycled well. So one of his latest ventures is taking um, decommissioned solar panels from uh, Massachusetts and sending them to his contacts in, I want to say, I want to say Cameroon or Nigeria, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, and you know, they'll use it to power a hotel and they'll use, you know, all these old panels and just keep using them because old panels don't go bad. They just are not as efficient. And so there's a lot of parts of the world that could really benefit from some of these decommissioned solar panels for extremely low prices. So really awesome guy. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out, you know, a big reason for like a lot of these programs is having, you know, resident input, um, having a lot of people engaged in this process and like helping to move the city forward. So we have the Recycling Advisory Committee, which has been around since 1991. It's a volunteer committee of residents, professionals, and some university representatives. And, you know, they are just a tremendous force in terms of like their ability to like galvanize the community, do outreach in the community, you know, nudge the city to think about doing something a little bit better. So big shout out to them. This is um, some, some of the members, some of the city staff, we are celebrating five years of the citywide curbside compost um, for the people that have been most intimately involved. So we had a nice little celebration for them. And um, they also helped us reduce or helped us launch the reduce and reuse webpage on the city webpage just recently. So I want to close with that um, talking about reduce and reuse they're always better than recycling composting of any kind. And I think we're all probably well aware of that. One of the difficulties though is, is, is what does that look like? So it can take a lot of forms. You know, some people do it as terms of like giving away unwanted items. Um, a lot of people do bring your own bag. Reusable water and coffee mugs are big. Um, you know, finding ways to opt out of things like junk mail. Um, and then there's refill stores in the city that people will use and, you know, work to do more on refilling instead of, you know, getting another virgin product. So check out our favorite tips on our webpage. Um, and I think it's a, it's kind of like a living webpage in my mind. You know, we're always looking for better and newer things to add into, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of reduce and reuse. And it's most impactful just due to community members' efforts because, Reducing and reusing is, is harder for us to kind of, you know, quantify. It's harder for us to to motivate and it's harder for us to manage um, when we're doing a lot of like the end of life for some items. So it really takes a lot um, of the community's efforts to make it happen. And I'm always, you know, thrilled to see the thousands of items exchanged monthly on buy nothing groups and Craigslist and other platforms. And so, you know, we're just always kind of thinking as what else can we do to shift the culture? And so I want to close with that um, and some of the questions that I have up here for you all, because, you know, I've talked at you for quite a long time. And now I really want to hear from you, like what your thoughts are and, you know, what we could be doing better as a community. And um, and I'm going to go first to the Q&A and then let's um, kind of have a dialogue. So I'm going to go ahead and 
stop sharing for a second so then I can stop the recording and go into questions.